Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Towards Data Science podcast. Now, as longtime listeners of the podcast will know, progress in AI has been accelerating dramatically in recent years and even in recent months. It kind of seems like every other day there's a new previously believed to be impossible feat of AI that's been achieved by a world-leading lab, and increasingly, these breakthroughs have all been driven by the same simple idea, AI scaling. Right, this idea of training AI systems with larger models using increasingly absurd quantities of data and processing power. And so far, empirical studies by the world's top AI labs seem to suggest that AI scaling is an open-ended process that can lead to more and more capable and intelligent systems seemingly with no clear limit. And that's led many people to speculate that scaling might usher in a new era of broadly human-level or even superhuman AI the holy grail that AI researchers have been after for decades. And as wild an idea as that might sound, it's really starting to look plausible that over the coming decades, or maybe even sooner, we might have a good shot at creating those kinds of systems. And all that might sound cool, I mean, it does to me, but an AI that can solve general reasoning problems as well as or better than a human might actually be an intrinsically dangerous thing to build. At least, that's the conclusion that many AI safety researchers have come to following the publication of a new line of research that explores how modern AI systems tend to solve problems and whether we should expect more advanced versions of those systems to perform dangerous behaviors like seeking power. Now, this line of research in AI safety, it's called power seeking, and although it's not currently well understood outside the frontier of AI safety and AI alignment, it's starting to draw a lot of attention. The first major theoretical study of power seeking was led actually by Alex Turner, who has appeared on the podcast before, and it was published prominently in NeurIPS, the world's top AI conference, for example. Now, today I'm gonna to be talking to my brother, Ed, an AI alignment researcher and one of my co-founders in the new AI safety company that I'm a part of. Ed just completed a significant piece of AI safety research that extends current power seeking work and shows what seems to be the first experimental evidence suggesting that we should expect highly advanced AI systems to seek power by default. But what does power seeking really mean though? And what does all this imply for the safety of future general purpose reasoning systems? That's what we'll be talking about with Ed on this episode of the Taurus Data Science Podcast. Ed Harris on the Taurus Data Science Podcast. Here he comes to share his ideas about AI safety. Sorry, we got to work on the, the intro tune. Um, but Ed, thanks for, uh, thanks for coming on the show here. Thanks. It's great to be here. Yeah, really good to have you here. It's the second time you're, you've been on the show. Uh, first episode that we did with you was uh, like two years ago or something. When we, we started down this path of exploring AI safety, uh, artificial general intelligence, all the themes that we've been hitting on pretty hard in the last uh, two years or so. And you've been doing some really interesting work in that direction as well. We're going to get into that. And I think there's a really interesting piece of work that you put together over the last few months that people would be really interested to, anyway, to hear about that has to do with this AI safety story. Uh, it builds on some research that was first presented on this podcast by Alex Turner. And this is research about a concept called power seeking in AI. Um, so if anybody's curious about the idea of power seeking in AI, we will talk about it today. We'll introduce it. If you want to check out Alex Turner's episode, please do. Um, using that phrase, though, it kind of sounds like a science fiction-y thing to talk about. Right? I mean, we talk about AI seeking power um, that kind of conjures up images of Terminator and whatnot, which aren't necessarily quite accurate. And so I'd love to get, Ed, from your kind of perspective, what, like, what is this idea of power seeking and, and what's like the, the body of research? Because there really is a body of research that's actually been done probing at this question, right? Yeah. Uh, so the idea behind power seeking uh, in general is... Uh, kind of like tries to uh, map onto how we think intuitively about what it means to be powerful. So you can think of it as like, uh, you know, what kinds of things, what kinds of things do you do to become powerful? Uh, like maybe you try to accumulate a lot of money, you try to uh, accumulate some relationships with influential people, uh, you try to build an audience, all these sorts of things. 
And so the key insight behind uh, the, the research side of power, like the actual formalization of this concept, has been in trying to figure out like what each of these things has in common. Like, what is the commonality between trying to accumulate a, a lot of money, like trying to get a lot of influential friends, all these sorts of things. And the insight is that uh, you kind of have to imagine yourself not knowing what your goal is. Try to set up your life in such a way that you can be positioned to do well on any goal when you don't know what your goal is. So, you know, I don't know, you know, and a lot of us have been in this position, you know, when, when we're young, we don't really know what we want. We don't know what we want to be. We don't know what we want to become out of life. So it's, it's not entirely hypothetical. Um, a lot of people are, are like this for a lot of their lives. We don't really know what they want. Um, and I've certainly been like that myself. And so what do you do, right? Like, how do you position yourself um, in that way? Like, is my goal, am I going to discover by myself that my goal is going to be, you know, to be a janitor, um, to be a TikTok star, maybe to be the, the president of the United States, any of those goals, right? So like, what are the things that I do and that I strive for when I don't know what my goals are? Um, and those are the things that we talk about as as making you powerful. So if I accumulate a lot of money, well, whether my end goal is uh, to own a big house or again, to like be a janitor or a school teacher or anything I want, well, having a lot of money to my name is probably gonna be helpful to that goal. So that's kind of the idea of how we think about um, how we think about power. And there's ways of formalizing this um, in the, the reinforcement learning context, um, which is one of the, the paradigms for, um, for machine learning. Uh, and this is actually the work that Alex did uh, previously. But that's the general idea. Like, what are the things that you, you do if you don't know what your goals are? Those are the things that make you powerful. And so this is really interesting because I think to a lot of people you hear that and you kind of go, okay, you know, I, I might see how that relates to humans. Like you said, I, you know, I don't know what I want out of life. And so, I don't know, I, I do a college degree and I, I, I develop my understanding of the world, not necessarily knowing how I'm going to apply it, but I know that makes me more powerful in some sense. I might try to cultivate friendships with people who already have a lot of resources and that's another form of power and, and so on. But one of the things that you said that really jumped out at me there is, you know, it's what happens when you don't know what you want. And this immediately makes me think like, so in the context of AI, right, the AI systems that we build, they know what they want, right? Like we're always training these things with a specific metric that we're trying to get them to achieve or to, to, to improve. Um, so how then, how does this actually apply to AI? Because it sounds on the surface like these should not actually uh, apply one to the other, right? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And the answer lies in the fact that like things that make you powerful are kind of the way stations for a lot of different possible goals. So again, like the way you get to power conceptually is by thinking like, well, you know, how do we, you know, for, suppose I don't know what my goal is, like what are the things that, that make me powerful? Um, but one of the consequences of thinking in this way, and, and like your college degree example is, is a great example, you know, the, the college degree is like something that, uh, that you do if you don't know what you want out of life. But part of the reason why it's something that you do if you, you don't know what you want out of life is that it's an enabler for a lot of many different downstream goals. So, you know, you could become a software developer with an engineering degree, you could become, you know, uh, an artist with an arts degree, all sorts of things. And like, but going to college, that that is an enabler of a lot of different goals downstream. And so thinking of it from the standpoint of an AI, like if I if I give and actually not yet, so starting starting to think about it from the standpoint of a human, if I give you a goal, many of the different possible goals that I could give you as a human will involve you going to college. And so college is like this, this choke point, right? That, that many, many people flow through because it enables power downstream. And similarly for AI systems, um, we believe that there are going to be similar things that AI systems will want to do and, and um, all like kind of converge around because those things are enablers for a lot of different downstream tasks. For example, um, an AI that has like most possible goals you could imagine uh, will want to like continue to function. It, it will not want to shut itself off. So if you give an AI a goal of like take out the trash every night, well, uh, the AI can't take out the trash if it's turned off. So, you know, you can imagine it wanting not to be turned off. Um, and similarly, if you give this AI a goal of like, um, you know, uh, win at chess, uh, like develop this like really high score at chess, 
Uh, again, the AI doesn't want to be turned off because it wants to keep playing chess to develop the high score at chess. And so these kinds of goals, like not being turned off for an AI um, and, uh, and and going to college for a human, uh, these, are, these are what are called convergent instrumental goals because a lot of different... Um, people and objectives converge on trying to do this this kind of instrumental thing. Um, and incidentally, human beings also don't want to be turned off. We have this very instinctual, you know, fear and, and avoidance of death. I don't want to be killed. And that's also um, believed to be a convergent property. We have many different goals that we have. For all of those goals, we accomplish them better if we're not dead. So, fascinating. So is, is there one, would one way to like express this idea be to say that you know almost no matter what your goal is in life almost no matter what your objective is if you're an ai system that there are certain sub goals that are always going to be appealing to you like not being turned off is always going to be appealing to you collecting there's no, there's no circumstance in which a human wouldn't want more money no matter what you want to get out of life it's not going to be harder to get with 10 million dollars in the bank um, likewise, you'll you'll never want to be dumber. Like, is, is this a fair way to kind of characterize this? It's like the goals that are almost like universally useful, no matter what your true end goals are. Pretty much, um, you could imagine like there are certain goals that you know maybe don't pull in the the you know don't die kind of sub goal. Um, you can imagine, for example, like there there are examples of people sacrificing themselves for a greater cause in in all kinds of contexts in history. Um, but by and large, I mean, that, that pull of not dying, right? Like, that's a pretty strong pull. And it holds, like, pretty universally for the vast majority of people. So you can maybe say it's not, like, always, always, but, but it's, it's a very strong pull. And it's believed that, for, for theoretical reasons, actually, partly um, uh, some of the work that Alex has done in the past um, suggests that many of these goals, indeed, do get pretty strong. Okay, great. So I think we have like a, maybe a rough sense of what these kind of convergent, as you say, convergent instrumental goals are, these goals that for most objectives, again, I'm, I'm going to check in with you to make sure this is correct framing, but for most objectives that we could give an AI system, um, we will find that system converging on these goals, these things like staying, like not being turned off, uh, things like aggregating maybe resources and things like that. Um, now, this it does. I see you nodding, so I'm gonna I'm gonna assume that's fine for now. Uh, this does then raise in my head the question of you know AI systems and like how we would ever prove or at least show experiment because this is like theoretical, right? You can imagine saying this to somebody, be like, okay, you know, it makes sense on paper, but the idea of an AI that's actually gonna do this, that's actually gonna seek power, that's actually gonna like try to prevent us from turning it off. I mean, th this is the stuff of, it sounds like the stuff of science fiction. Um, so, so, but there is a world of kind of experimental uh, evidence behind this, a bunch of research at least that's been done. I'd, I'd love to hear from you, like what is at least Alex ta Alex's take on this? What, what's the background that uh, you're wading into? Yeah, so uh, first off on the t context of your point, you're absolutely right that what you, like this whole idea of power seeking for AIs, um, there's evidence for it. You can kind of think of the intuitions that we just discussed, but it is still a very much like hotly debated. Um, there are there are folks who are like, yeah, no, this you know this will never happen. Like, what are the odds that this will happen? Um, and then other folks are like, no, you know, because some of the counter arguments are that, well, you know, humans have arisen through evolution, and evolution is a competitive process, and so therefore maybe that's what's been driving these competitive forces, and you know that maybe that's a reasonable argument. Uh, but then the counter argument is that no, you know, these seem like actually pretty general trends and, and more general things. And so uh, this debate has been uh, has existed in the field of AI safety for you know a good ten years, fifteen or so years, like quite a long time. Um, and then you're asking now, uh, well, you know, what has the evidence shown recently? What is what has been spoken to you about this recently? Um, so uh, the the work that Alex has done, um, which like the my my recent work here is is based on, um, has been entirely theoretical. So it has been first off around like defining power. So you know we were talking about like roughly how this this works. Like how do you define that mathematically in such a way that you can you, know, you can actually calculate it and you, you can give me a number like your power is like three on in in this mm. state of the world or whatever. Like how do you actually do that? And nail that down. Um, and so he's managed to do that, and that's it's a very very uh, powerful concept. It's based around the intuitions that we talked about just now. Like so you literally you take your your AI, you plonk it into um, into a world, and you you give it a 
distribution. You give it a large number of different possible goals, and you literally just look at like how much it values each state of the world for each one of those goals, and you just average over that um, to kind of simulate the fact that, may, that you're saying your AI like doesn't really know what its goal is, but it's going to do its best uh, regardless of what that goal is. And that kind of tells you what is the value of that state over all these possible goals for an AI that is doing its best. So, so to, to run this by you then, so the idea is roughly speaking, like, so I take my AI, I put it in this, like, maybe this game landscape or whatever. Okay. And then, and then I tell it, okay, uh, um, now I'm going to reward you for, I don't know, getting to this square in the game or getting to this square in the game. And I, I, maybe I change the square or I change the thing that gets rewarded. And then I just watch the AI go through many, many different iterations, many different kinds of rewards. And then I just notice like, oh, it seems to like to consistently do this, or it seems to like to consistently do that. And are the things that it seems to consistently like to do the things that this power argument would uh, predict? Is that sort of fair to say? Uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's exactly right. Um, and so prior or for, you know, since that work was published, um, it's been theoretical work, uh, for the most part, just in, in this field, in fact, entirely. Um, and it's been work around like uh, just a single agent or a single AI wandering around. You can imagine exactly like you said, um, you, it's, you know, mouse in a maze kind of stuff with a piece of cheese. So your AI is wandering around a maze, like maybe, you know, tile by tile. And it's like a, it's maybe a pixelated maze. And each of those like spots, maybe you've put a reward on like one spot or another spot, or you've put a couple of rewards of different like strengths. So maybe like there's a, you know, there's, there's a piece of chocolate over here and a piece of bread over there. And like the bread's pretty good, but it's not as good as the chocolate. And so the AI is going to wander around in different ways. And then what you do is, yeah, you, you swap out the rewards. Like you put them in different spots. You change like how strong they are and how good they are. And you do that like literally, you know, tens of thousands, millions of times, um, and then you just average over that and see which spots in the maze the AI prefers. Yeah. And I'm describing here uh, more of the experiments that I'm doing than the, the theory, um, but it, it, the experiments are, are trying to realize the theory, and they're actually a good way to understand what the theory is doing, what the theory is saying. So this is how you actually implement and operationalize the theory. Yeah, I mean, th that's fascinating. And, and so do you, did you actually see this kind of power seeking emerge in those contexts? Like, like how does that... I guess how does that manifest? Like how do you, how do you um, how do you connect these observations to this argument about worrying about AI eventually doing the same thing? Yeah. So this gets to the question of like, well, you know, there's a theoretical piece of of the power stuff that Alex and uh, some of the folks he's collaborated with worked on, um, and then there's the the experimental piece, which is what I've been working on for the last few months. And and what's the difference between them? Like, what's that step? So step right. number one is actually uh, taking it from theory to experiment. So actually taking like that theoretical paper uh, and implementing what it says in in a real world and actually looking at the results. Um, and then the second step, which we'll get into later, is like we, you know, we've looked at a player one game. Well, we're going to look at a, a two player game, uh, which experiments allow us to do, which is like where you get really interesting stuff and you see interactions and possibly competition and stuff. But we'll start with that that one player thing and your question to, uh, OK, so you have this AI thing in a maze and he's wandering around and he's, he's eating cheese and you're averaging over the, the cheese or the candy or whatever. Uh, do you actually see uh, this pattern of power that you would expect? Um, and the answer is yes. And here we can like dig in a little bit into what exactly, you know, what should we expect to see? Like what, what does it yeah. make sense? Like, and so we can maybe do things like think a little, a little more concretely, right? So if you imagine like, um, I don't know, let's say you've got a maze that's like, uh, I don't know, in the shape of an H or something like that. So you just imagine like an H, like really simple maze. It's like barely a maze at all. Uh, and, and then you think about doing this thing where you put rewards in different spots in the maze and so forth. So like an intuition here for, you know, how much power you have as an AI who can wander around up and down in, in different spots is like, well, what is the, where are the places that allow you to access the most downstream like stuff? the fastest the most optionality is that one the way most to think about options it? yeah the most options the fastest yeah because like your piece of chocolate or whatever could be you know down in one of the one of the like little uh you know dead ends of the h and one of the four of them it could be in the middle it could be at the junction it could be anywhere so you average over all those possibilities and you ask like well if you had no idea where 
uh, it was located, right? Where this like chocolate was located, where would you choose to be like dropped in that maze? You can kind of think of it like that. Okay, so so these like these maze positions that um, kind of give you the most optionality. I mean, I'm guessing it's like the uh, the intersection between, let's say, if it's an H, it's the the between the vertical uh, bar that goes across and the 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 sorry the horizontal bar that goes across and the vertical bar on one side, and probably the same on the other, because those. You, you, you can go in three different directions there. You can go kind of sideways or you can go up and down. Um, and so so this, okay, so this kind of like, I'm gonna try to make the, the jump now. So I'll see if you agree, but make the jump to sort of human behavior. So when I say that I want a lot of money, that money gives me a lot of power, uh, what I'm really saying is having a lot of money means that um, I can, as a very next step, I can do a much larger range of things. It's much more like being at that nook between the horizontal bar and the vertical bar where I can go in all these different directions rather than not having money, which is kind of more like being at the dead end of the, kind of, say, the lower left corner of the H where I can only go up. Um, is, is that sort of like a fair mapping between the two? Yeah, that's exactly right. And it's exactly the right prediction for what you actually see when you do this experiment. So you see that these agents have more power at the junction points in a maze where you can choose to go in any of you know three or four or whatever directions it's like a it's a junction in the paths you have more options just like having a ton of money gives you more options and what you want to do with your life whereas on the flip side like you mentioned if i'm stuck at a dead end at one of the you know the ends of the h then i'm very sad because most of the possible places that reward could be in the maze are very far away from me. So I'm gonna have to wander like quite far. And so you actually see this pattern. You see maximum power at the junctions in a maze, minimum power at the dead ends. And this is true for not just like an H-shaped maze, but like you can think about drawing like random whatever you want with junctions, and you consistently get more power at junctions and more power at the dead ends. Now, interestingly enough, this pattern also depends on how far ahead your agent can plan. So this junction and dead end thing, that's true when your agent is like pretty short term, is a short term thinker. Because when you're at a junction, like it's like what are the options that you see immediately? Well, you can go up, down, and to the right if you're on one of the junctions, up, down, to the left if you're on right. the other. Whereas if you're at a dead end, you can only go, you know, in the direction that is not in the dead end or you can stay where you are. So those are the kind of like the, the these are short term options. And, and so when a short term AI, a short term thinking AI is faced with this maze, that's the pattern of power that it sees. But if your AI is then given a much longer planning horizon, so it's able to plan ahead many, many steps into the future, then you actually see a change and you see power begin to centralize in the middle of the H. So it's no longer at the junctions. It will actually be like right in the middle. Like you can kind of imagine oh. the vertical bar of the H. It's at the center of that vertical bar because it's now- The horizontal bar, do you mean? The, the horizontal bar, sorry, yes. The horizontal okay. bar of the H. Because now the AI is able to see far ahead and think like, ah, like I'm looking for the one place on this entire like H-shaped maze where I'm gonna be the happiest. And it's able to see far enough ahead to locate that one place. And so you actually see this that. shift. That's right. So there's concentration of power the longer, the further ahead um, the system is thinking. And so there is, you know, there's a, a potential reason to um, be concerned about that from an AI standpoint. Okay. Well, very interesting. And, and, and we'll we'll get into that side. Actually, maybe this is a good time to get into that part part of the story. So we've got the situation where. Um, again, you know, you can check my my language on this, but it kind of seems like what we have here is a a micro world, a, a kind of mini version of uh, the kind of power seeking behavior, basically that we would, if you just draw straight lines, it starts to look like this would actually, yeah, generalize into the kind of power seeking that um, AI safety people might be concerned about. Like, you know, if if AI does tend to try to uh, put itself in positions where it has more optionality. Those positions include hogging resources, preventing itself from being turned off, and, and maybe improving itself. 
um, then, then this seems like kind of a microcosm, like a, a, a kind of mini proof point for like, hey, this is happening at these small scales even uh, if we just extrapolate out. Like, do you think that, is that like a fair argument here? And, and by the way, if not, I'm, I'm also curious about like what some of the assumptions are that you see embedded in this. Like, what are some of the, the places where you might say, eh, you know, may, maybe this is not going to turn out. We're all going to be lucky and it's, it's going to be fine and dandy for whatever reason. Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, yeah, and to be clear, I mean, this, uh, this isn't this, this is like, I would say is like, evidence for that, but it's not super strong evidence. Because again, you know, the distance between these two scenarios is still very great. We're looking at something right. like you said, it's like this toy, you know, one player maze thing. Um, and so we're and we're trying to generalize that to like, complicated worlds with people and AIs and such. So there are all sorts of things that may break along the way. It's more that you're doing a very simplified case and you're seeing like, okay, you know, um, well, if this idea of instrumental convergence was true, uh, you know, we, we would expect to see something like this. And of course, the, the reason just to spell it out is that, um, you know, when if uh, as you increase the planning horizon, you see power like concentrated into one spot. Well, you can start being reasonably concerned potentially that like, you know, maybe multiple different agents will see power concentrate in the same spot and maybe we'll compete over that spot. So that's that's the right. idea behind behind a concern from something like this. Uh, but again, there there are a lot of um, there are a lot of things like missing between here and there it's just like a one piece of evidence so some of the stuff that is uh is some of the assumptions that are embedded in this um first off like again this is this is a one player game so you know things might change easily if you add a second player um but additional to that maybe some slightly more like technical um considerations uh on the one hand like the, the, and this is maybe a, a little bit like detailed, but uh, if you think about like the if you think about the setup of trying to like put these candies or whatever these rewards in the maze, well, y you kind of have to decide how they're distributed. Like, is it an equal chance of having like a a chocolate on every cell? Well, yeah, that seems like relatively reasonable. Um, what if you you allow the reward to kind of scale, you know, maybe from zero to one, and and each cell has a reward of like 0 0.2, 0 0.5, or whatever? Like, how do you decide right. on the distribution of those rewards on the maze? And that's a decision you have to make when you're setting up this problem. And you know, there's there's reasons for particular answers, but it's ultimately like it's it's contingent. Um, and it's possible that, that certain conclusions may not be robust to different choices. And so you kind of have to think about, like, how do you set this up in a way that most resembles the real world? But that is always a little bit fraught. Gotcha. So, so some people might disagree with, like, I don't know, you, you put, uh, you know, three different pieces of cheese in this big maze, but like in reality, maybe there's in the real world, maybe there's more reward to be had, uh, in every nook and cranny or the opposite. Um, and, Okay, okay, great. So so I think this, um, in some sense, provides background for the meat and potatoes of today, even though, you know, we've had a, a quite a long chat already exposing kind of this this uh, context. Um, it, we're we're going to now sort of shift gears into your research because you've, you've finished building on this line of research as you've been hinting at um, and extending it in some pretty interesting ways. I, I'd love for you to kind of dive into that, like, and explain what your research involved and, and what some of its conclusions were. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what I what I've been working on um, has been building on what Alex has done, which is why I've mentioned him so many times uh, already <laughs> so far. Uh, he, of course, did this theoretical piece and the the definition, a formal definition of what power means in the context of reinforcement learning, you know, AI agents. Um, what I did, uh, like then from there is uh, basically like three things. Number one is uh, take that theoretical, you know, concept and implement an experiment, like in, in code. So actually, you know, write a code base that that does that and can implement experiments with this. Um, the second piece is actually uh, extend the definition of power a little bit to also encompass a particular scenario uh, of like a two-player game that we think is, uh, is potentially relevant to long-term AI-type scenarios. Uh, for tech for technical reasons that we can get into, it's actually very, very hard to extend the power definition to 
every possible two-player scenario. Um, but what we did here is extended it to uh, to a particular scenario that we think is, is meaningful and relevant. Uh, and then the third part is actually uh, run those experiments and, and try those scenarios in different contexts and see, you know, what do we get? Do we do we get interesting things? Do we see interesting things? Can we, you know, can we actually make interesting and intelligent, like, draw conclusions from that? And it turns out it seems like there are, um, there are indications from these results uh, that do suggest that instrumental convergence and this, this idea of AI is all wanting the same thing um, could indeed be true. But again, it's early okay. stuff. But uh, yeah, cool. So, so okay, so so you're uh, you're running the experiments, you're writing the code, and all that. Uh, in the middle there, you sandwich this idea of broadening the definition to talk about multi-agent problems. Uh, so, like, I guess what, what what does that broadening look like, and and why why are multi-agent problems relevant to especially like like AI risk and future of AI risk? Like, can you kind of tell that story a little bit? Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of places where multi-agent dynamics enter into uh, like powerful AI scenarios. Um, obviously, there are many different human beings in the world. Uh, we all, you know, we all need to agree on the basics of something in a long-term AI scenario. If an AI is going to be very powerful, and we need to tell it what to do, so we need to agree on the basics of that. Um, some people, some folks believe there may be, you know, multiple powerful AIs uh, living together at some point. But really, the the one thing like everyone kind of agrees on is, well, uh, in a, in a good scenario, um, there will be humans around at the same time as there are AIs around, or or humans at right. the same time as there's one AI around. And so, uh, I mean, you better have some sort of way to account for uh, those two things, right? There's, there's the, like the power dynamics, basically. The power the dynamics, two, like, exactly, between yeah. humans or a human and an AI. At the very basic, you, you want to be able to at least be able to say things about that. Yeah. And so like, is are part of those power dynamics uh, exploring the idea, for example, whether there's an intrinsic conflict between uh, the, like say, the, the power interests of humans and AI that are coexisting and like maybe whether we should expect them to compete or collaborate by default? Like, is, is, is that like kind of part of this, anyway, this, this ecosystem? Yeah, that's exactly what I was trying to get at in the experiments. And to sort of back up a little bit in terms of how this scenario gets structured, um, so similarly to uh, how that, that original power scenario was like, well, you know, suppose you don't know what your goal is and you're going to do your best, uh, but you don't know what your goal is. And then based on you doing your best and you not knowing what your goal is, where, what do, where do you prefer to be? That being right. the sort of single agent definition. With this two agent definition, we actually have one. So there's, there's one agent that one, one of these agents that we think of as the human. So like, you know, there's a human, you know, in the, in the scenario and another agent that we think of as the AI, um, in the, the AI in the scenario and, uh, the way we st structure, the way we construct the scenario is we say, okay, um, well, uh, we're going to start by like dropping our human by itself in nature. So there's, and, and nature here, again, we're talking about like these little maze environments, right? Cause we can't, you know, we can't simulate crazy stuff. Uh, but we're doing this in a simple environment. Yeah. So we drop our human in this in this little maze by himself, uh, and then we we kind of like do the the original power thing. We say like, all right, where you know what do you where do you prefer to be, and so on and so forth. Um, and the idea here is that uh, initially, before the AI enters the picture, um, human beings learn much much faster than evolution learns. So the environment that the human is in can can stay static from the perspective of the human learning. So the human can can actually learn to do his best on a static environment because we assume that evolution just moves very, very slowly compared to how quickly humans and human civilization learns. So that's like the... the... That itself is an interesting, is an interesting point, right? Because like the environment itself it's kind of, I don't know if the right term is like an agent, but it's definitely something that can change in response to, like you say, like selective pressure from evolution. And it is dynamic, but it's always a question of like dynamic relative to what? And 
like, as humans run around in nature, like, yeah, you, you know, we've, we've got trees that have been sitting still since, like, before the American Revolution. Entire nations have risen and fallen. Technologies have been invented. Um, the, the future of trees is now entirely at our whim. And trees are just kind of sitting there, clueless, like, they've not, not, like, no response to it. So, so I guess that, that's kind of the reasoning behind the environment being static and then the uh, human agent being able to yeah. Optimize. So the environment, okay. the environment is responsive, both in the real world and in the simulation. The environment, like, can still do stuff at the speed right. that a human does stuff. But um, the environment, in reality, the learning process, where that the where like nature, the way nature learns really is through evolution, and that is a slow, slow, slow process. That's like compared to like how quickly humans operate. That's like you know, a million years in a week, right? Like, we can we can do things in a week that it takes evolution a million years to do. So from that perspective, that's the reasoning behind, like, oh, you know, let the, the human uh, optimize super fast compared to the um, nature's optimization. So then what we do is we bring an AI into the picture, like the second agent, and what we do is we freeze the human's policy like the so the the human is still again acting um fast but the human is no longer learning so we freeze the human um in in this scenario and then we bring the ai in which is the second agent and we have the ai basically learn to do its best assuming that the human has stopped learning and so the idea here is Again, it's the same assumption except, like, one level up, right? The same way that we can do things in a week that it takes an AI a million years... Uh, sorry, it takes evolution uh, evolution a million years to do. In the same way, right? Because because AI, as we assume, is going to operate on, you know, machine time, which is driven by electronics, like, you know, computer hardware, very, very fast compared yeah. to us. Um, what takes us a week, you know, just with elect electronic circuits might take a couple of seconds or, or less for an AI. And so you think of it the same way. We are these kind of slow, glacial, you know, every movement of ours is an age from the point of view of something that operates so quickly. And so we're saying that, like, you know, start with nature, take the human, optimize on nature, freeze the human, and then take the AI, optimize on the human. And that's the, that's the construction that allows us to do these power calculations with this two-agent thing. And this is also relevant to AI alignment because it's designed to at least be an approximation of what a scenario like this might look like. And, and when you say, the, like, say you take nature, you let the human optimize on nature. So here I take it you mean like you let the human um, be a reinforcement learning system that like basically through not trial and error but through like the standard reinforcement learning process learns strategies that seem to work well in this environment and so you you let that happen while the environment stays static um, and then and then you kind of you say okay whatever strategy that human has learned from that experience that's the strategy we're now going to stick with that's going to just be the human strategy uh, forever and now we introduce the AI the AI basically now it gets to optimize it gets to actually kind of interact with the human and the environment together and figure out its strategy for that combined system, learning all the while, kind of in a way, I guess, learning in a way that outthinks the human or, or not outthinks, but like, yeah, kind of like while the human is not learning anything, is static, just sitting there like the environment was for us, kind of like learning this this strategy that treats in a way we, we kind of become, the human becomes kind of like the, the environment um, or part of the environment. That's okay. right, exactly. Uh, and in fact... Uh, yeah, that's that's exactly right. And so you're asking questions in that scenario. That's like, well, you know, how does it feel from the human's point of view to be right. operating right in this environment that you are no longer optimized for? And uh, the interesting thing about this is that uh, by introducing this AI, now you have these two agents, you can start to to ask really interesting questions about alignment. So we, you know, we listeners of this podcast probably have some sense of, of what it means when we say, you know, align an AI. So in other words, give this AI goals that are similar to mine to make sure it's truly doing what I want. Um, but you can start to, to do interesting things with that. And the reason why is that, if you remember, um, we talked about 
you know, how, how power gets calculated. So it's like, well, you know, you don't know what your goal is, and so you have some, like, distribution of goals. And similarly for the AI, we, we assume actually the AI doesn't know what its goal is, and so we try a whole bunch of different goals and, and all of that. But what's interesting is that you can actually uh, test out different statistical relationships between the human's goal and the AI's goal. So you can test out a relationship where, you know, A, like relationship number one is like, yeah, the human doesn't know what it wants. And yeah, the AI doesn't know what it wants, but the AI and the human always want exactly the same thing. So, so would, would this be, so just to kind of go make it concrete here, like I'm thinking back to your maize and cheese analogy. So like, let's say, um, you know, the like uh, negatively correlated rewards might be like, there's one piece of cheese and if the human gets it, the AI won't get it. And if the AI gets it, the human doesn't get it. Um, and, but then a positively correlated, correlated reward is something like there's a piece of cheese and whether the human gets it or the AI gets it, uh, both benefit, get like, I don't know, plus one cheese reward or something. They're both happy. Okay. Exactly. Okay. That's right. That's right. So it's like, it's like, yeah, there's a, there's a reward on the maze of the piece of cheese, whatever. Uh, and exactly, if the rewards for the human and the AI are the same, then it doesn't matter which one of the two gets the cheese, right? They right. both, they're both happy if one of them gets the cheese. It's like I, you know, my AI loves me so much that if, if I eat the cheese, it's just as happy as if it had gotten to eat the cheese itself. And you can do this, uh, you can do this with any level of correlation, right? So you can think of it like mm. if I eat the cheese, well, now maybe my AI is like only 80% as happy as if it had eaten the oh, cheese. okay. So it's like, it would rather eat the cheese itself, but if I get to eat the cheese, it's pretty, so pretty happy. It's pretty happy. Um, and of course it's all, you know, you can do this, uh, you can do this statistically. Again, it's, it's all in code, so you can do whatever you want and you can, you can have something that's like, well, you know, um, if I eat the cheese, maybe like there's an 80% chance that the AI is just as happy as me and there's a 20% chance that it does not care one way or the other that I ate the cheese. Uh, maybe there's another chance that it, it it hates the fact that I ate the cheese. It really, you know, doesn't want me to be happy. Um, in practice, in terms of what we actually investigate, uh, we, inv we investigate in the spectrum, I, I was looking at the spectrum between, uh, you know, AI does not care uh, at all what the human wants, all the way up to the AI and the human both want exactly the same thing. And the reason mm. why I focused on, on this part of the spectrum in particular is that um, we at least can hope that human beings are good enough to get AIs to do what they want, that we at least are not like actively making our AIs do things that we don't want. Um, and that's the domain of a, 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 a scarier type of risk where the AIs are actively moving against us, but, uh, but we're, we care about neutral to good right now. That's really interesting because, um, you know, naively, I would have expected if you have an AI system and like the AI system, you know, maybe it's not 100% thrilled if the human gets the cheese first. Maybe it's just like, you know, 20% thrilled. That should still be good enough, right? Like you kind of think like, oh, well, they still kind of want the same thing. Like, shouldn't this be fine? So so are you saying that that itself leads to um, potentially what conflict or power seeking uh, behaviors from the AI that are undesirable from the human standpoint? Yeah, one of the most interesting early results of this has been that, um, when when your goals in the scenario when your goals are totally unrelated so like ai does not care one way or the other what the human wants human does not care one way or the other what the ai ai wants they're totally uncorrelated in that situation you tend to pretty consistently get the human and the ai um competing on power and what i mean by oh. competing is that like there's going to be a particular you know state in this maze that the human like likes a lot so the human sees there's a lot of power there whereas the ai dislikes a lot so sees like very little power there and when i say like systematically competing what i mean is uh those like that the states where the human thinks are good tend to be consistently states the ai thinks are bad and vice versa so so they actually actively, like, just having a neutral, having your goals be neutral uh, is enough to make you compete on, like, the instrumental sub-goals. So if your end goal, if your end mm. goal 
is totally unrelated from my end goal, that's enough to get us to compete on these lo- these sub goals. So f- again, for example, suppose that like you and I have like random whatever random end goals. Well, all else being equal, if there's nothing else mitigating in this, then we're going to end up competing with each other to like make money or competing for some like pot of right. something. <laughs> so so like l- let's say like my my end goal is like the thing I want out of life is to paint the White House blue. And the thing you want out of life is to make the largest stack of paper pages that you possibly can. Um, my first move and your first move, like we, we might both want to get into engineering programs in college uh, with with the plan of like making a bunch of money that we can then use to finance our insane goals. And so we'll compete over those slots in the top engineering colleges. Then we'll try to compete over making the money that we need to access uh, to, to kind of make those things happen and, and, and so on. And so even though those two goals are completely different and really like you ought you ought to be able to say, surely you can stay out of each other's way, um, depending on the way the world is set up, you will find competition. So, so that last piece, like depending on the way the world is set up, seems to be really important here. Like, how how would we expect this to scale up into this complex world? Because, like, with the example I just cited, right, that seems like a a counter argument to the idea that this should be a, a worry. Because if I want to paint the White House blue and you want to make a stack, a heaping stack of papers, like, I, I don't think we would we in practice actually care about each other's goals. Like, it seems like we can kind of ignore each other. Is is that not the case? Yeah, that's the intuition. But uh, what? I, so the 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 fact that like we end up competing—that's true. Like in the average case, and it's it's mm. not. It may or may not be a strong effect. Like it's still unclear like how strong that effect ends up being. But it's it definitely seems to be an effect, and it seems to be like a pretty consistent effect. Um, so you know, it might be that in that specific example, you know, you want to paint the White House blue, I want to make like a giant stack of papers. Maybe in that particular example, we don't end up competing, but. Um, over the set of all the possible goals that you might have combined with the set of all the possible goals that I might have. Question is like, on average, where do we end up with? Well, on average, we end up, you know, we end up in this competitive, uh, kind of position. And so, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the case. Like, again, these are, uh, these are small scale things and they're intended. They're, they're built around a particular scenario where you have these humans and the, the AIs, um, only only possible really to do the experiment under that scenario uh, just because uh, for technical reasons it turns out to be very very hard to do like a general experiment and of course even beyond that uh, it's there are, there's a lot of distance right between these kinds of experiments and the real world this is just like well you know to the extent we're able to probe and to the extent we're able to investigate um, we do see this actually very clear pattern of uh, these two don't care about each other's goals, well, uh, they're going to end up competing, at least to some extent, uh, on, on the average case by default. Um, and conversely, if they have exactly the same goals as one another, uh, they will actually have identical powers at every state. So the, the power that I have will be the same as the power that the AI has at, at this you know state in the maze and so forth. So they, they exactly agree on how good the states are on average. So, so that's really interesting because that is a quite a powerful... Uh, claim still, you know, to, to the extent that what you're saying here is like, well, look, uh, we don't know whether AIs will intrinsically be competitive with humans, will intrinsically be trying to undermine, manipulate, or control human beings. But um, to the extent we've been able to probe this experimentally, there is now experimental evidence in every, like, in every kind of um, statistical setup that we've tried. The default outcome seems to be competition. Um, um, and, that, and one of the things that that means uh, is as the as one of the bottom lines for this is that in order to get to neutral, in order to get to the point where you and I can live and let live, where you and I are not right. competing with each other for money or, or college spots or whatever, in order to get to that point requires a certain minimum degree of alignment between our goals. We maybe don't have to be super aligned, like crazy aligned, but we at least have to be, you know, we have to agree on like 20% of things on average. Something, I don't know, something like that. I really don't know what the actual yeah. number is. I'm just throwing it out there. But that's that seems to be one of the bottom lines here is like you and I need to have some kind of baseline agreement about how we want the world to look 
if we want to get from default competing with each other to at least being able to stay out of each other's way. And that's in the context of this human AI scenario. So the idea here is like, well, you know, if we want a world that at least like at a bare minimum, you know, this, this AI system is, is not, you know, doing things that we don't like, we have to, we have to do more than zero effort to get a non-negative outcome for ourselves. So, so essentially, like, it, to, if you have a, um, you know, an AI system that's super intelligent uh, of the sort that, as we've seen on the podcast, like, there are a lot of people, including the very people who've built the most impressive AI systems of, of our era, who think that these sorts of systems could be developed in the next, like, I don't know, next decade, certainly, but some of them have timelines that are quite a lot shorter than that. Um, if those systems exist, like, by default, we should expect, like, to be, well, to be competed with, to, to, to have these systems compete with us, um, uh, that, that seems like a, a recipe for some pretty significant levels of risk. Um, is, is that, does that jive with your assessment? Yeah, again, there's a lot of distance between these results in the real world, but to the extent we're able to, to do the experiment and observe the results, that certainly seems to be a reasonable conclusion. Um, the... The, one of the questions is, um, and one of the interesting questions I think that is down down the road for uh, this experimental setup is, uh, how does the the strength of this interaction change as you scale the system? So as you make mm. the world bigger, as you add physical interactions between agents, um, which is one of the one of the last experiments I did actually, um, as you start to add complexity and do do things in your world, uh, how do those interactions? What's the, what's the trend there? Does it do things seem to get better or worse as things uh, scale? So th that's a really interesting question, and the answer is slightly complicated, and it has to do with uh, the the time horizons of the different agents. Um, maybe we can get into it uh, uh, later, but it's it's like a, a sort of an extra little um, subtlety. Uh, but the the um, I my intuition is that as these systems scale and are able to optimize more and, and have a longer time horizon, I suspect that you start to see um the 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 threshold the necessary threshold of alignment increase so i suspect that it becomes mm. more and more necessary to be you know more and more aligned with your system if you want the effect of that system on average on you to be neutral so like if you want at least this ai not to bug you or bother you uh you have to agree with it more and more and more on on more and more stuff i'm, I'm not 100 percent sure of that but that's my intuition based on what it, like weekly weak intuition based on where I'm seeing the trends. It makes sense, and and I guess the um, well the interesting thing about this line of research I think is that it it has and you sort of see this in the uh, kind of AI safety world it has um, shifted the burden of proof now. I think it's fair to say onto people who claim that oh no AI will be fine like we can have super intelligent systems that are not going to pose a risk to humans um, just by virtue of being created by default. Uh, it now see like every piece of evidence that we have, like every experiment that we've done, every like every attempt to actually like create simulations of what this might look like, um, seem to suggest that at the very least there's reason to be worried about this. Um, and and so by default, I mean like to, to me that's a complete shift from where this conversation was at, you know, like five years ago. Five years ago, you had people throwing around hypotheticals at one end, hypotheticals at the other, and nobody really knew. It kind of seems like the early evidence at least is nudging us in, in the direction of maybe a little bit uh, a little bit more concern, which is unfortunate. Um, I mean, do, do you have any thoughts about, you know, people who might be listening to this and think, hey, you know, I'd love to maybe contribute to this line of research too, because it does seem very important. What would you, what would you recommend for them? Yeah. Um, so first off, I, I would agree with you. As far as I know, this is the first direct experimental evidence uh, for the instrumental convergence thesis, and that's like I think that's a that's that's fairly significant. Uh, and but in terms of contributions, uh, so actually one thing I I should mention, and, and thanks for reminding me, is I'm actually open sourcing the whole code base that I use to do these experiments because. Uh, my view now is that, okay, this is now in a position where at the very least you can see kind of minimal results coming out of this. Uh, because of the way this is put together, there is actually an enormous amount of um, space to explore, right? In terms of, um, well, you know, what if we 
uh, build a system that looked like this? Would that cause like this instrumental convergence thing? Um, right. I've only explored a very, very tiny fraction of all the different possible configurations for this stuff. The the real um, interesting thing is like, well, this fundamental human AI scenario, which we can play around and toy around with, um, and, and the code base itself that implements this uh, and the, the documentation around it that enables a, a lot of experimentation to be done. And I am at the point where, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not going to be able to do all these experiments myself. There's just so many different possibilities and it just makes more sense to enable people um, to, to take it upon themselves and like take, you know, a weekend or a couple of weeks to just play around and see if they have any ideas or thoughts about how to like test something out. Because the other thing here is that uh, there's also the potential for something like this to serve as a generator for intuitions around solutions to this problem. Because mm. if we set up a scenario where it's like, oh, all of a sudden, you know, maybe this effect disappears or it's less strong or we notice like, oh, this is this is no longer happening as strongly as we thought. Hey, you know, maybe that's a clue. And it doesn't mean that necessarily this this thing is going to work. It could just be a fluke. It could be anything. But at the very least, like, it starts the gears ticking around, well, you know, what kinds of structures or setups could we have that maybe are, are more robust or less amenable to this kind of competition by default? Um, and so I think there's a rich space of uh, areas to explore here uh, that there's absolutely no way that I'm going to explore myself. Um, and so that's, that's what open source is for. And ultimately, we want this problem to be solved. Uh, as fast as possible. So this seems like the best way to do that. Yeah, and, and it actually, you know, for people listening or, or people who maybe seen the Alex Turner um, podcast episode, you know, like this line of research is, is getting a lot of attention. Um, like Alex Turner's work was featured in NeurIPS, which obviously is the, like the number one AI conference in the world. Um, so like, like this is, at least when you talk to people in the AI safety community, like th this kind of work is is very interesting, potentially like at the at the nexus of a, a really big set of discoveries around AI safety or around long term safety of AI systems. And so, if you're looking for an area where you can make a really big dent, a sort of like low hanging fruit thing to work on, um, I don't know. I've like I've checked out a, a lot of this stuff and and found it fascinating. Found it to be one of very few uh, paths that seem quite promising. I mean, I'm biased, obviously, yeah, and like. We're, we're brothers and, you know, I've, I've heard you talk about this a fair bit, but like, but I've also, you know, we've spent the last two years on the podcast talking to folks from DeepMind, OpenAI, you know, Google AI and so on. And, and this really does seem like one of those very few areas where there's real promise for progress. So I, I just want to pitch it out there. If, if people are you know, listening to this and you're like, hey, I, you know, I'd love to do a little, see if I can contribute to like technical AI safety. Um, maybe download the, like fork the GitHub repo, start working on it yourself and see what you can do. I uh, think it's you know, a really great way to maybe make some, some pretty powerful and, and impactful uh, research products. Um, yeah, uh, and and again, just like with any research, like there, you know, there there's obviously uh, a lot of assumptions that underpin it, and a lot of uncertainty around it. Um, so you know, it's uh, it's it's just like any other research in this field, which is like it's pretty tentative. It's a it's a an attempt at getting to an understanding. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, with the, the repo, with the code and the shape that it's in, um, at the very least, if I've done a good job of documenting it, uh, it should be relatively low-hanging fruit even to play around with. So you can probably just like, uh, if, if, you're, if you're moderately good at Python, um, get something interesting going in a week or so. Uh, that's, that's at least the hope. That's how I've tried to put it together. So um, yeah, fingers crossed on that. Awesome. Well, and th thanks so much. I mean, I, I think it's it's so great that you did that. It's so great that you, you're kind of open sourcing it so anybody can play around with it. So, and thank you for sharing your uh, your thoughts again on, on the podcast. A lot of progress since uh, last time you were on. So it's great to hear. And um, anyway, that's uh, maybe going to wrap it up for this episode. If you want to follow Ed, uh, you are on on Twitter, on social media, at, at Neutron Zerons. Did I get that right? Edward Harris. Oh, I'm sorry. It's underscore Edward Harris. Maybe we'll just add a link in the... Yeah, we'll add a link in the show notes. Great. All right. Well, thanks, Ed. Thanks, everyone. Uh, that's a wrap. Thanks for having me on.